Oh, and if I was a better person, I would be holding the book right now, but I'm not. Yeah, so always ending with the bad endings. Bad, bad at ending videos. Okay, that's so annoying. My camera totally turned off when I was talking about the last book and I don't know where it turned off. So, um, well, and then um, another book. Um, debut author, debut novel, right? Is it a debut? Hi everyone, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse. Today's video is going to be my March Reading Rewind and if you watched my March catch-up video you know I had a bit of a slump kind of crap month. Um, but I still read six books which isn't awful by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I did have a hard time getting into reading and like getting into books and sticking with it. So with the exception of one two <laughs> I would say it wasn't the book's fault it was me there were two books I just didn't it, you'll you'll hear all about it didn't go didn't go well um, but for the most part the books that I did read I did really enjoy I did end the, um, the month on a really high note I think um, with a book that I really loved so this is March in a nutshell the first book that I read is The Night Olivia Fell by Christina McDonald and this um this book came out in january this was on one of my most anticipated reads lists and um christina mcdonald's a journalist this is her first book though and i was really excited to read it and really intrigued by the story and this story is about olivia who is the daughter of abby and the book opens this is back cover stuff as always with abby getting a phone call that olivia has fallen and she is in the hospital, she is brain dead, and she is pregnant. And Abby had no idea that her daughter was pregnant. She has no idea what happened that night, obviously. And Olivia needs to be kept alive in order to save the baby. So this book is all of the extremely obvious, heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching, things that a mother would go through getting this news about her daughter and also all the questions she has about what happened that night. And the police are very much kind of ruling this as an accident. Abby doesn't believe it. And we start to get this story from Abby's perspective. We get it from Olivia's perspective. There are flashbacks that, you know, go all the way back to when Abby was first pregnant and really build the story of this mother and daughter and what they have gone through in their lives and what was happening in Olivia's life um, to lead us up to that fabulous conclusion. So I really enjoyed this book. I'm very happy I got it. Um, I've said many times I'm really trying to be selective on books that I'm purchasing this year, especially new author books, but I had heard so many rave reviews about this and it just kind of kept haunting me in a good way about wanting to read it. I could not for the life of me score it at my library. So I'm so happy that I bought it. Um, it's just a really, it's a, it's a good story. It's well written. It's well told. The secrets are woven in, the mysteries are woven in. There's some very interesting characters in this. I think they're, you know, things that sort of surprised me. I didn't find it like crazy predictable in any kind of way. I was on the ride, I was all in, like I was fully invested. Um, and I just, you feel so much for Abby because you're hearing so much in her voice and then you hear Olivia's voice and feel so much for her. So I really loved it. I, I marked it up a ton. I underlined in it, which is always a terrific sign for me. Um, so good, so good. I completely recommend this book. And I was just flipping through it now um, looking at it and I had highlighted something in it that even now just sort of like gave me a little goosebump. So if you'll indulge me for half a second, there's just this one line in the book and it says, sometimes the rest of your life arrived by simply saying goodbye. <sighs> I just love it. I love it. So I'm very excited to see what else Christina McDonald does. Um, but yes, I am a fan. I am in. This was a an anticipated read that absolutely, um, you know, hit it for me. The next book I read is Her Every Fear by Peter Swanson. And this is a book that I got last year and like kept meaning to read and life gets in the way. But I was introduced to Peter Swanson last year when I read The Kind Worth Killing, which I loved 
So I talked about that, I wanna say like in my November wrap up video, um, I'll link that if you guys didn't see it. Obsessed and quickly became obsessed with Peter Swanson. And this book didn't disappoint. I did not, um, did not quite know what to expect from it. So again, keeping it jackety um, in my description, it is about a woman named Kate who is from England and her cousin Corbin who lives in Beacon Hill in Boston. And though they have never met, they obviously know who one another is through family. And Corbin gets a job in London and sort of pitches this idea of what if he and Kate swap apartments for the six months? Well, he's gonna be in London, she can come to the US and um, enroll in like some art classes in school and it, it all makes sense for Kate. So they agree to do it. The book opens kind of when Kate arrives literally in Boston. And Kate is kind of dealing with kind of her own personal baggage. She has had some big old trauma um, kind of haunting her from her past that has made her a bit reclusive, has definitely given her anxiety and panic attacks, and she's really had a lot of struggles. So the fact that she's even like leaving London is huge, and her family's worried about her, but she wants to do it. So she comes, she gets to Corbin's apartment. Um, it's like this insanely beautiful, ridiculously huge, lavish apartment in Beacon Hill. Um, as a former Bostonian, I know Beacon Hill well, so I can picture this completely. And mystery sort of abounds from the get-go in that Corbin's neighbor, Audrey, is found murdered. And the police are all over this. They're questioning everyone. Poor sweet Kate, who has so much trauma from her past, literally just moved in next door to a girl who was found dead the day after she got there. And you can only imagine the questions that are going on, the attention that's happening here, and the questions that Kate has for Corbin, and that the police have for Corbin, and it's it's great. Other than the fact that Audrey is the dead girl, so every time I read that, I was like, great guys, um, thanks Peter. But I absolutely love this book, and you get things from Kate's perspective, you get things from Corbin's perspective, we go back in time, everything starts to piece together. Again, there's some really interesting characters in this. I am 100% a sucker for a book set in Boston. I love the locale. Um, I just love those, you know, familiar spots and things that resonate with me. But I really enjoyed this book. And this was a book, like I said at the beginning, I had um, a rough month, which really started kind of last month, where I would sort of slowly get into books. And this was a book where like, slowly got into it, slowly got into it, and then devoured it. And I absolutely needed to know how it ended. So if you are a psychological thriller fan, if you are a Peter Swanson fan, um, if you're just looking for something new, I would recommend this one. I really enjoyed um, the read. So very pleased with this one. The next book I read is If You Want to Write by Brenda Euland. And I actually wound up listening to this on audiobook and in an effort to jumpstart my creativity and to try and crawl out of a hole, I wanted to read um, a writing inspiration book, which is what this is, obviously. It's called If You Want to Write. And this is a book I've had forever and just never read it, obviously. And I just did not connect with this book at all. And this book, this book originally was published in 1938. And I don't wanna say like you can tell, but I just, I was, I was very disconnected from it. And people either like love this book or hate this book. And I pains me to like hate on anybody's book. I just, I hate, I mean, I hated it. I just didn't, I didn't connect with what she was saying. I didn't find it inspirational at all. I found it really rambly. Um, there's a lot in here where she's like referring to other people's writings. So you're reading other people's writings and it just, it did nothing for me. There's so many great books about writing out there, um, whether it's like Stephen King or Annie Lamont or Donald Mass or In the Forest for the Trees. I think that's Betsy Lerner. Like there's so many amazing writing books out there. So I would say like, if you loved this book, more power to you. Um, I didn't, so I'm gonna be unhauling the physical copy of it. I just held on to it for the video. And yeah, so my attempt to jumpstart my creativity failed <laughs> epically. So in a continued effort to de-slump myself, I wanted to 
try and pick a book that I thought like I knew I was going to love. And it's so funny, um, not like haha -ha funny, but I was watching Heather from Bookables today and she just posted a video about like five ways to get out of a reading slump. And one of her suggestions was to read a book by like an author you know, or to like revisit a favorite book. And these are two things I did in the next two books, not even knowing that these were some of her tips. But the first one was Hidden Bodies by Carolyn Kempness. And this is the sequel to You, which I loved. And I read that, I wanna say also last November. Um, I'll link the video on that. I talked about that kind of obsessively when I first started my channel because I loved that book. And I was so happy to have a chance to hang out with Joe again and all of his twisted, creepy ass stuff that he does. Um, so yeah, that's Hidden Bodies. And this picks up, I'm not gonna spoil anything for you, about you for you, but he is kind of like at it again, has a new girlfriend, he's out in LA this time, and sort of like picks up where he left off slash ups his game. And it's interesting to me that it seems like there are people who were like, I thought you was crazy amazing, oh my God, it was the best thing ever. Or there are people who were like, oh my God, like you was okay, but Hidden Bodies was crazy amazing, it was the best thing ever. I am in the camp of, I thought you was better than this. And this wasn't a bad book. And I don't know if it's because you sort of like set a stage for me and sort of set a bar for me and it was all new in that, that I was like, holy crap, like this is, this is well written, this character is horrible, 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 but I really, really like him. Um, and that I was sort of like living it for the first time with him in Hidden Bodies, which again, I enjoyed it. And I, um, you know, I read it quickly and I wanted to see where it was going to go. But I found that, I almost found that there was like a little bit too much coincidence for Joe and things worked out for him. Not in, um, again, it's always so tricky to talk about these kinds of books without spoilers. Like not in a way where it was like, crap, I can't even say it. Just in the sense of like being at the right place at the right time or the right people at the right time or something is like seemed way too easy for him that should have been far more complicated. Um, it just seemed like a whole lot of coincidence that really just sort of worked out in his favor. And I did not feel that about you. Like you to me felt much more sort of on the edge of my seat and he was definitely creative and he definitely had to be like his charming self. Um, but I feel like there were more close calls for him and you, if that makes any kind of sense. So I liked this. I liked the characters in this. I did like being with him again, but I also think if it ended with you and this book didn't exist, I would be completely satisfied with Joe and with his journey. So I'm curious, they are doing, so if you didn't know, you was originally made into a, like an eight or 10 part series on Lifetime. Now Netflix has taken it on and they are doing a season two of it. I don't know if it's going to follow Hidden Bodies because the ending of the TV show was different than the ending of the book slightly. Um, so I'm not quite sure where the TV show is going to go. I will be curious. I'll be curious what they do with it. I am 100% going to watch it. I will read other things by Carolyn Kempness. This was not, like I say, this was not a bad book in any kind of a way. But when I think about um, like books that are duologies, so I have talked about Emily Giffen and she did Something Borrowed was her first book um, and Something Blue was the conclusion to it. And it's um, these best friends, Rachel and Darcy. So Something Borrowed is very much Rachel's perspective and Something Blue was Darcy's. And for me, I had a completely different feeling about Darcy by the end of Something Blue. And it, I mean, in all fairness, it was told from her perspective. I think I would have been satisfied had Something Borrowed always just been the end of the story, but Something Blue took me on a whole new journey and let me see these characters in a different way and have a different appreciation for things. So to me, that was a duology that was amazing. And now I can't imagine it one without the other. Whereas, um, like if this didn't exist, I would have been okay. And this is not to discourage people from reading it. I'm making it sound like I didn't like it as much as I did, but I just, I, I think I just thought you was so incredible. Um, I just, <laughs> 
I liked Joe's creepiness in you better. Does that make sense? So anyway, um, yeah, so that's Hidden Bodies. So I also talked about this in my March recap. I attempted to do Buzzwordathon in March, obviously, because it's a March recap. And I basically just failed, like went up in flames. But I read, finished one book, which is Who Will Run the Frog Hospital by Laurie Moore. Um, I will link that March recap so you can um, hear me talk a bit there. But this was on my 2019, or, yeah, 2019 reread list. This is a book I really loved um, when I was younger. And I really enjoyed it a second time around. It took me a freaking week to read a 200 page book, which is humiliating on every level. Um, but yeah, so this was basically the only book I read on Buzzwordathon, but I liked it. Super briefly, I attempted to read Everything is Perfect When You're a Liar by Kelly Oxford, which is nonfiction. It's a compilation of essays. She became super famous kind of from her Twitter. Um, she wrote a lot of sort of like funny, snarky, um, kind of great tweets about motherhood and life and all sorts of stuff. And I picked this book up a really long time ago and I flipped through and thought some of it was funny. I wound up trying to listen to the audiobook this time around. I got, I think it was like 40 or 50 pages in was the equivalent of it. DNF'd it, didn't like it, didn't connect to it, didn't think anything was funny. Um, so I was either in like a weirdo headspace the day that I picked this thing up or I'm not the person I was when I picked this book up, but didn't find it funny. Uh, yeah, no, boo, done, bad. I also mentioned in my March update that I was reading What Alice Forgot by Leanne Moriarty. And as you can tell by the bookmark, <laughs> I'm still reading What Alice Forgot. And I'm enjoying it. It's just slow. So it's kind of like a very slow reveal of a story. I still feel like I'm a, in a little bit of like a physical reading slump. It's also been a little bit of a hectic um, few days, so I just haven't had time to like sit down and commit. And when I finally sit down at the end of the night, I'm doing one of those like reading where you're falling asleep type of a things. So I'm like 200 pages in at this stage. I am going to finish it. I like it. I want to see where the story goes. And it's funny that Heather, um, Heather's video about being in a slump, one of the things she also says is like, don't be afraid to DNF a book and then come back to it later. So I think what I might wind up doing, and we'll see where I'm at, um, I'm filming this on March 30th, just in case you guys were wondering. So I am doing the Booklist Readathon that starts April 1, so if I'm not done with this book by then, and I don't think I'm going to, um, I'm just gonna put a pin in it, do the Booklist Readathon, and then come back to it. So stay tuned for kind of final thoughts on this book, but so far I'm enjoying it. The last book I read is an audiobook, and it is All Be Gone in the Dark by Michelle McNamara. This is nonfiction, true crime, and it is about um, the Golden State Killer, which I will pop a picture of it, and I think that's on the front cover of it, so duh, you probably already know what it's about. But I will be honest, I am not like a huge true crime reader, so I'm always fascinated, but kind of in like the, um, like OJ and like John Bonet and Menendez and Versace and kind of, um, I watched Dirty John, which was on Bravo. And I have to say like, well, like I enjoyed it and I love Connie Britton. I actually more enjoyed, there was like a true, kind of a true life documentary about what happened with that. And I kind of liked that one more than like the serialized version. I, I like, I, I hate to say that like these horrible, crime books are incredible, but this was such a fascinating and incredible story. And for me, it was twofold because for one, you have this insane crime. So if you are like me and had no idea who the Golden State Killer was until you picked up this book, he basically is this guy who tortured the state of California. And it started out sort of as robberies and break-ins and then he escalated to rapes and then he escalated to murdering his victims and it was kind of up and down throughout california from the mid 70s to the mid 80s and the police didn't have a clue they had no leads they had no links they couldn't stop him obviously and it was like all of a sudden kind of like i think it was like 1986 like he just stopped and was never heard from again and it was a big cold case. And Michelle McNamara is a journalist. She had um, a true crime blog and website and became completely obsessed with this case. 
she passed away in 2016. Um, she passed away in her sleep. She had an undiagnosed heart condition, which I guess was made worse by the fact she was on some painkillers and I think some antidepressants. Horrible story. She married. Um, just completely tragic story. And she died sort of while she was in the middle of writing this book after, you know, years and years of researching and working with police officers and, you know, speaking with, with victims and witnesses and just, she delved so deep into this. And the good news is, if we can find the silver lining here, the Golden State Killer was caught in 2018. And there's huge debate about whether her work had anything to do with it. Um, you know, I think the police sort of very politely are like, no, we've always had a task force on this. It wasn't her, but there's a huge swarm of people and I tend to be in their camp of, you know, she resurrected this, she brought it back to the surface, she put so much into it. She got people talking about it, she got people looking into things and in some small part had something to do with this. And, you know, her husband who, um, you know, speaks in the afterword on the book, he's like, you know, she never wanted any kind of credit for this. She just wanted the guy caught. She just wanted some solace to be given to the victims to know that this was finally closed. They finally got the guy who was haunted these people for all these years. And, you know, it's, it's an incredibly fascinating story again, like in a, in a, in a horribly tragic way about what he did to all of these people. And it details all of these cases and all of these things that he has done. And it goes you know, through timelines, but the way the book is written is also interspersed with so much of her journey and her research and the people she worked with. Um, you know, there's sort of historical elements in the fact of like when, when DNA came on the scene and profiling and all of these things, you know, the databases that didn't exist, you know, back in the seventies and, you know, like I say, kind of revisiting all of this evidence that they had. And then, you know, she disperses in, you know, some of her story and her family and her husband and her life and kind of her whole journey. When she was a teenager, a neighbor of hers was murdered and it was never solved. And she sort of attributes that as kind of the defining moment that sparked her interest in crime writing and cold cases and investigations and, you know, all of this stuff. So, it's amazing that the people that she worked with were able to put this book together and put it out and get it out into the world. It is, like I say, it, it is the most well-researched book. It is a completely fascinating tale of Michelle herself and her quest. And I think like the tagline is like a one woman's obsession. Um, and also the crime itself and just how many lives this man affected and how much havoc and just horrible things that he wreaked. Um, on California at the time. So if you are a true crime fan, if there is a curiosity factor, if you have some intrigue, I would completely recommend this book. I was really blown away by it. It, it exceeded my expectations. Um, it gave me all the creepy chills and I was reading some reviews after the fact. And I don't know if it's because I was listening to it, that it was maybe like a little less personal. Like if I was reading it, I don't know if the graphic nature of it would have been worse to me. And it, it's graphic. They talk about, you know, the crime scenes and, and what happened to these victims. So it's, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, what was a little bit hard to follow. And I, some people who did the audiobook mentioned this as well is there's obviously a huge timeline. There's so many victims. Um, it's hard, you know, she talks about people back and forth in different names and different cities because it's, it didn't all happen in one place. So it's a little bit hard to follow along, but there's so much stuff on the internet that you could certainly print out a timeline or a list. If you have the actual book, it's in there obviously. And I believe if you purchase the audiobook, there's downloads that go with it, but it's, it's a lot of information, which is no discouragement in reading the book, but I really enjoyed it. I was completely surprised by how much I did. Um, Gillian Flynn does the introduction and she's the audio just for the intro. And I will say the woman who did the audiobook was wonderful, but I selfishly wished Gillian Flynn spoke the entire time because I just adore her too. I completely enjoyed this book um, way more than I expected to. I am glad I kind of challenged myself with something I normally wouldn't have picked up. I'm glad I did the audiobook. I definitely feel like that got me kind of back into a zone. I was listening to it compulsively. I wanted to know what happened next. And it was a good 
way to end the month in the sense that it was a book that I really enjoyed, even though it was like very difficult subject matter. So I'm glad I rec um, I'm glad I read it. I do recommend it. And yeah, that was that was how I ended March. That is my look back at March. Hopefully, I am leaving my slump my bad mood, my bad leg, and all of that kind of stuff behind me. Um, let me know what you guys read this month, uh, if you have read any of the books that I read, what you thought of them, and also how you guys are all doing. So thanks for coming today, coming like you came by my house. Thanks for tuning in today and watching me talk to you from my house. And let me know what's going on with you. I will be back with some more stuff at some stage of the game, so hopefully you'll be here too. And I will see you in those videos. Bye, everybody.